I made a rather disturbing discovery this morning. I gained a sudden understanding of aging and immortality. So aging apparently is not as much about our bodies getting older, but uh, watching our contemporaries and our heroes all pass away before us. And their immortality is contained in us by all the things that they taught us and showed us and their passing while painful can to, can increase our determination to use the tools they gave us but it's it's still a bit of a shocker when you realize that you know many of the people that altered your life who are 10, 15, 20 years older than you are all going to go away at some point in time and you're going to eventually sort of feel very alone. But you're not because obviously everyone has new people around them all the time and family and friends. But somehow spiritually and musically you end up being alone especially for musicians or for I guess I suppose for any craft when your teachers and your heroes die you you're left there with nothing but what you took from their genius and what you decide to do with that is their immortality. first thing that greeted me this morning was a Facebook post um, from Mark O'Connor, uh, one of the world's greatest fiddlers, a man I've known most of my life, and it was to announce the passing of, of Byron Berline. Now, I know that many of, of you some, many of you will know who he was, and some of you will have no idea, and that's part of the magic of Byron. Uh, Byron Berline was one of the greatest fiddlers that ever drew a bow. And it wasn't just his, how brilliant he was as a player. It was his chameleon-like abilities to fit into any situation. As a session player, the man... Like, I first heard Byron Berline on an album... Uh, of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, their, their seminal record that had Mr. Bojangles on it and House at Pooh Corner and all the, like the, the classic, classic record. And he played fiddle on a couple of things on that album and his fiddling was just ridiculously good. And that's how I discovered Byron Berline. And then, and then he he played with everybody. He he even recorded with the Rolling Stones. He did recordings with the Rolling Stones. He played with Bill Monroe for a year and co-wrote Gold Rush, which is like one of the 
the, his, the, just one of the classic standards of bluegrass instrumentals. And he wrote Huckleberry Hornpipe, which was, you know, another, like a guitar standard was on my very first record. And so, yeah, it was, the man, the man was, if you, if you don't know him, go on YouTube and find him because he was a genius, genius player. And, uh, he, he just, he, he influenced so many people because he, he, he was the, he was the, one of the templates for me as a musician because of his ability to step just effortlessly from one style of music into another. Like it didn't matter if it was a bluegrass band or a rock band or a jazz band or mountain music or anything. He could just, he just knew how to fit. The man was... A, a, a ninja musician. As time went on in my own career, um, uh, I I discovered him, re rediscovered him. Um, well, it's interesting how many times he made an appearance in my life. Like, so those initial, those old recordings that I heard him playing pop music. Um, and bluegrass, of course, because he recorded Gold Rush with Bill. And uh, so he was always around because one of my other heroes, Dan Crary, decided to put a band together with this guy and a banjo player named John Hickman, who also just passed away in May at 78 years of age. And those three guys just completely blew everybody's face off because they were three in, they were three ninja musicians like Crary. I've talked at length about Crary, how good he, he is and was and still is. He's 80 some years old and still playing. And so Byron became part of that soundtrack he was the fiddler for all these things that Crary was doing. And so I couldn't almost, I just couldn't escape him. He was, he was, he was just part of the soundtrack of, of a huge like slice of my pie of guitar players. I was listening to when I was 15, 16, 15, you know, 15 to 20, you know? And I remember the first time I ever met Byron, I, <laughs> he was uh uh well we w it was in Winfield, Kansas and I've I've gone through this story way way early way back. I was 16 years old and just turned 16 and me and and Ray Legere and uh we're at we're at the Walnut Valley Festival in Winfield, Kansas for the for the guitar competition and the mandolin competition. They had a competition for every instrument there. And the one of the acts that was on the festival, of course, was 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 BCH, Crary and 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 Burline and Hickman, right? And I remember, I still to this day remember coming down through the this big shed where they had where they had a, a the can the canteen, and I had just bought a hamburger and some fries, and. I was walking around with my guitar in one hand and this plate with this paper plate with a burger and some fries on it. And I saw all three guys standing down at the end of the, of the shed. So I didn't, I was like, I was fearless when I was a kid. So I just, I, I rushed right down there and put my everything down and put the plate on the table, picnic table there and introduced myself and, Byron Berline, well, they were all real nice to me, but Byron Berline was just like a, the only way to describe him was like a mischievous uncle. That He treated me like that. And he, 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 he I started asking him questions about all kinds of things. And he, he just reached and started eating my fries. And every time he took one, he, he put it in his mouth and looked me right, look at me, right? Like, and just like, 
And then he started doing it really slow. <laughs> and I, he had me roaring laughing. And <clears throat> then I, I, I asked him all kinds of questions about, well, I was really interested in Huckleberry Hornpipe. And I said, you know, how the, how in the name of God, where did you come up with that I, the, the idea for that tune? And, and he said, well, it was, he said, I, I, it was just a warm-up. It was something that, it was, it was sort of a thing that I went through every time I picked up the fiddle to just get my hands working. And pretty soon it, it became a tune. And one hell of a tune it became, a, a three-parter. That was that's just amazing, and it's 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 one of the standards of instru of instrumentals in bluegrass to this day for guitar players and fiddlers and mandolin players. And uh, so, yeah, and I remember I just remember standing there with him, and he was uh, he was just such a nice man, and I and I I ended up picking a little with him. I pulled my guitar out and said, let's play it. And he whipped the fiddle out, and we did. We played it right into the shed there. And Crary and Hickman were watching us, and then they, they kind of wandered away. And and Byron never forgot that. He never forgot me. Years later, he, he called us to go play the festival. And he still remembered, you know, standing under the shed eating my fries, right? And... uh he was just a, a beautiful man, and, a, and, a, and a, like one of the people that, and I've said this many times, I, I've been blessed to meet these people that meant so much to me, and 99% of them were just gold. They were just amazing people. The 1%, well, we don't talk about them much, but the, he was one of the 99, and Somehow, you know, that cemented a lot of things between between him and me and Crary. I didn't know Hickman as well. I didn't get to meet him as many times. But a relationship formed between, especially between me and Dr. Crary, Dr. Dan. He, him and I ended up playing a lot of music together over the years. And uh, so it was just one of those things that, and I, I couldn't help but, but Mark had posted Mark had posted a video on YouTube this morning. It was an unreleased video of of Mark recording his album called Heroes, and he did Gold Rush on that album, and it was an amazing video. It was twenty six minutes long because there was multiple takes of this of the tune, and it was him and Byron and Bill Monroe, and John Hickman, Dan Crary, and Roy Husky Jr. on the bass. And he said it, and it struck me the same way. Everybody on that film, except him and Crary, are all gone. And I knew every one of them. I, I played with Bill. I played with Husky in the studio many times played with, uh, you know, I knew, I met Hickman multiple times. It was, it really, I just sat there and watched the video, you know, and, and cried. It was just like, you want to talk about a life in music, right? Like this, this is, this is the story of all of us where we, you know, we watch these people that we idolize grow old, right, and pass away. And if we're lucky enough to have have come in contact with them and, you know, interact with them in some way, it, it's just, they change people's lives. You know, they, they changed millions of people's lives. All of them, right? That led me into thinking in, about... You know, why people watch this series or would watch any artist do what I've been doing for the past 60 some weeks. You know, it, it put me in the shoes of every person who supports my music 
or supports anybody's music. I hate, I don't even like to use the word fans. It's such a cheap, silly, you know, egotistical word. But people, my friends, you know, and there's potentially millions of them, I guess, according to the analytics on YouTube and Facebook and those things. And, you know, I, I sell halls out everywhere I go, so there must be a lot of people listening. You know, and they, and they, and I, I was instantly in their shoes thinking about why do they, why is it so important for them to meet me? What, what are, what are they getting that's so much extra by just shaking my hand and doing whatever? And, and I, and I, and I realized I, now I, you know, I've, I've, it's, it's the same thing. It's me interacting with Berline and interacting with all the people in that video, right, through my life. It meant something to me for a different reason, mind you, right? You know, the supporters of music, people who aren't musicians, who love music and love particular artists, right? They, they're not seeing it from the position of, uh, you know, utilizing the knowledge of that artist, but it's the same feeling. It's like they're utilizing the art itself as a as a healing bomb and a and a, a vehicle for their own personal memories and the good things in their lives and or or the bad things that that the music makes them feel better about because when they listen to it they don't feel alone. And it's just it's very very deep. It's and every time this happens, you know, every time we lose one of these guys, it it just gets, it just seems like, and I thought, and it's the way I introduced the video this morning, it's pretty soon all those guys will be gone. If I'm lucky enough to outlive those people, if I'm allowed to stay here long enough, it'll just be me with my memories of them. And, and the licks and the tunes and the knowledge. So you, you, everyone that passes, you, you feel like, you feel a great sense of loss, but you also feel a great sense of responsibility so that they're, what they did doesn't die, right, with them. That you always pay homage to them in some way for the rest of your career, you know? It's great to be. It's great to create your own thing, and and do that and do it regularly and well. But it's also important to acknowledge the fact that, in truth, uh, nothing is new. Everything's already been done. We're just all of us. I think all artists, with a rare exception are just doing things, doing, we build what we do out of these building blocks from every single idol that we have in our lives. And our, our playing and our writing and our, and our invention is a composite, a mosaic of that information. And uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's an incredible thing. And it's what creates immortality among artists that they inspire people so much that a guy like me or anybody, a guy like me, it doesn't matter who it is, we carry on playing and if you listen to what we do, you can hear little snippets of all the people that I admire in my music. And uh, it's it really is mind-boggling. It's... Uh, it's almost a paradox or something. It's uh, it's very interesting, and it's it's something that you could discuss, and it's a rabbit hole you could go down for years trying to you know just trying to under get a grasp of all of it, and it's the biggest part of your life when you're a musician is the influence that these great genius players had on you, right? And then, because what happens then, of course, is that you, if you love them, you then have to research who they loved. You know, I'm sure that Byron Berline listened to Tommy Gerald and Benny Thomason and 
you know, Benny Martin and any number of players that would have influenced Byron. So you have to also go back and watch them. And so it, it doesn't matter what you do, you're, you're down a rabbit hole. And it's the best rabbit hole in the world. And that's why music is so healing and so important because it takes our minds off ourselves. It shows us the unimportance of ourselves. And we are okay with it because we realize that we may never create what some of these guys created. You know, and, and that it makes you humble and it makes you realize that life's a short season, man. A short season. You better do everything you can to have a good time and to pass on whatever knowledge you possibly can. Because without that, when you, if you don't do that, when you die, you're dead. You're gone forever. The, your, immortality, your immortality is based upon your influence of other people. And it's, no, it's never been any clearer. It never gets any clearer until you lose somebody like Byron or you lose somebody like John Hickman or Tony Rice or Doc Watson or the people that have passed on, you know, in the last 10 years that were just... We've lost dozens of them. And uh really starts to weigh on you, you know, as you get older. You know, I'm not that old yet. I'm 52, but, you know, when I was a kid, I thought, these guys will be around forever. How, how could they possibly die? Because they were so powerful in my life, right? But they can die. They'll go away eventually. It's also at times like this when you start to question your own output. Am I doing enough, you know, to, is my work good enough and enough of it to matter, you know, like, there's a lot of that in, in, in being an artist where you, you want to make sure that, that what you're doing is influential, you, that you reach people Especially other musicians, you know, and guy, not just, not just your peers. Peers are different, right? You want the acceptance of your peers, and that's very important because it gives you, it just feels good when somebody who, you know, who who is as good or better than you looks at you and goes, "Man, that was, a, that's a great record, or that's a great song, or that's, a, or you, that was a great break you took, or whatever." Those things mean everything, right? It just gives you, it just gives you the, the, it recharges the batteries so that you can just keep on going no matter what. You always, you're always thinking, well, actually, that's the problem. Sometimes you don't think enough about, uh, is something I'm doing influencing a beginner? or somebody who's not in the business yet who wants to be in the business. Is this good enough to to get them to, you know, to give it their all? Because there's, there's no other way to be in this business except sacrificing everything. That's, that's the key, right? People don't realize that. You can't just... The, the, the music business and being an artist for a living and following your heart and your creative f flow or whatever you want to call it, it's not something you can just, uh, um, like, toy with. It isn't something... As a matter of fact, when you do that, it, when you just put your toes in the water... And don't commit to it. It's it's kind of a bad thing. It it it's for, for two reasons. Number one, if you just jumped right in and did it, you might produce some of the most brilliant things that have ever been done, and you would influence people yourself, right? Um. And the second thing is, if you don't, if you just tentative, tentatively stick your toes in there, sometimes you're standing in the way of someone who wants to jump in the water. And so, 
it's I mean it's a deep subject, right? But you have to if you if you think you have it and nobody knows what it is. That's the other that's the other problem. Some of the most unlikely people in the world have have done some of the most incredible music, you know. Think of a guy like Christofferson who not a good singer, not a good guitar player, but one of the best writers ever. And he just jumped in and did it. It was, it was what he wanted to do, and that's what he did. And that's and, and so he's left behind this unbelievable catalog of music. Could you imagine if that guy had had just fooled around with it and never really, you know, he just maybe I just want to play some clubs and stuff, and I'll do something else on the weekdays. We w- imagine what the world would have been cheated out of. Even though he didn't really have all the all the all the all the the musical tools to 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 be a performer, although I love his singing, I love his voice and his guitar playing. I just love him, right? He he had a he was a fantastic composer. And there's lots of other guys, you know, like just Leon Redbone, another fellow we lost recently. This man was an an, an enigma wrapped in three riddles. Like he was a brilliant guitarist and a brilliant singer. But what he did was so bizarre and outside of the normal realm. There was a man right there that could have easily just said, well, I'll just kind of fool around with it. I'm not going to bother, like, really getting, you know, I'll just do this for fun on the weekends or I'll do this for, I won't, you know, I'll do it, I'll do something else on the side. Nope. He jumped in with both feet, even though he knew at the time that he was, not the norm, not commercial, not any of those things. And that's the difference, right? I mean, that's the difference between, you know, just trying to do, trying to do music and not really committing to the sacrifice and the, and the, and the, you just, you have to really give up everything else in your life. If you want to do this at a level that it that matters, that's going to matter in the long run, you have to you have to really invest in in it. And by the same token, I've met lots of people that I wish would would, and they won't. Right? They they go in a little bit, and you realize and as soon as you hear them play and sing or whatever, you're like, holy crap! You're you're you're, you're an electrician or whatever they do, and it just doesn't make any sense to you, right? You know that these people could could do, could do have the world, right? But they just don't. And I don't know why, and I've never known that. I've never known why people don't see their own talent sometimes. And I've met great players that just preferred to to not go take that the final leap right they just preferred to do it on their own terms and play when they wanted to play and they became legends legends you know just com- completely legendary because you you couldn't readily hear them you had to go to a certain town at a certain time of day to even hear them play you know like and that in itself is a bit of a a a, a ploy right to achieve a certain kind of fame and notoriety. But it's weird, you know, and it's, and of course, I know it's not for everybody, you know. Not everybody is, who is very talented is going to look at the situation and go, well, I'm, not, I'm going to forego, forego getting married and having kids and having a stable income and I'm just going to do music, right? Even though they are every bit capable of doing it, they, I mean, it's, it's inbred in us to not desert that kind of stability in life and that's what sets all players apart is the ones who are willing to to say to hell with stability we don't care and they just go and follow the music all the way down the rabbit hole for their entire life those are the guys that end up really influencing people and then you've got the ones who are who don't do anything and could and you get the ones who are sort of sitting, the, sitting on the fence. 
they have a potential of influencing people, but but not as much if, as, as if they would take the full plunge, which I, I believe a lot of them should. But it's very fascinating. It's, it's incredibly fascinating. You know, at a time like this, you know, sitting here this morning realizing that man's gone, you really start thinking about, you know, the life choices that put artists in that pantheon of of heavy influencers, right? People who change the course of other people's lives and and techniques and, and musical outlooks and opinions just because they decided, well, I'm not doing nothing else but play my fiddle. You know? Or I'm not doing... I'm, I'm just going to play the fiddle. I'm going to teach fiddle. I'm going to live the fiddle. And it's amazing what you can do when that's in place. And I should also say, obviously, that, you know, almost almost all musicians end up married and many have, have families and all that stuff, but they always do it after the fact, right? Most of the time. And that leads you down another rabbit hole. When you, If you decide to do music for your life, your whole life, you meet a different set of people. Like, it, it, music is such a, uh, a gathering point for humans, right? You, you doing it, and you end up meeting a whole different class and section, subsection of the population. Like, there's no telling what would happen, you know? And that's how it usually works, you know? But you've got to make that commitment first. It's almost like, you know, in, in, the, in the normal world, you go get a degree to fall back on. Well, you know, if you decide early on that you're only doing music, you spend eight, ten years doing it first until you're established as, you know, as much as you can get. And then you do have some, some stability if you want to get married and have a family and all these things. Like, it's, it's, a, it's just a whole different outlook on life, I think, uh, being, being a professional artist, right? So how does it all play out? at the end, right? So we've lost Byron. We've lost a bunch of great players recently. And I know everywhere in the world today there's going to be people remembering Byron, right? And remembering his music, remembering him as a man. You know, Mark O'Connor was heavily influenced by Berline and and said so this morning in his post. And, I, and I, my condolences go out to him and his family. And to Byron's family, and to Crary, who's the last one standing. He's, I hope he doesn't leave us too soon. But he's the last one of the three, you know, that's that's left out of that out of that trio, you know. And it's just very sobering, very sobering. And realizing that now it's up to us to to take a little piece of of Byron with us, and we will. That's exactly how it'll work. You know, there'll be a there will be a large outpouring immediately now of people who will tribute him and talk about him and and he do, he doesn't go away after that's all over. All those players and stuff they they'll they'll just take that little piece of him and sort of permanently put it in their own mosaic of their playing and their and their and their thought process about playing and music and that's the beauty of it. He's left us here, but he'll never be gone because we will make sure of that. Um, yeah, and I, I guess I don't know if there could be any more noble an ending for anybody, you know? One of the reasons that music is so incredibly important to all of us, even whether we realize it or not, one of the things that we take for granted every single day. Music is in every single thing we encounter on a daily basis, 24-7. It doesn't matter if you're listening to the radio. It's, it's used for, you know, from television commercials right to Muzak in an elevator. There is some music playing around you at every possible moment. 
And there's a reason for that, because it's important. It's important for us. It builds community, and it builds memory, and it builds... It attaches itself to us through a million means and ways. And I'm, I'm proud that I spent my whole life doing it. And uh, I hope that I can leave a legacy behind as Byron did. The same as all the people that I know in this business. That's all we really want in the end. Is just to leave something behind that will never be forgotten. That's, that's the whole point of this, I think. And there really isn't much more meaning to it. Just trying to make people happy. And that happiness lasts forever. And you see it every day. So, yeah. I'll, here's to Byron Burline. <laughs> Thank you.